I am uh, glad that you guys are here and excited about the series that we have been doing. It's, uh, it is, uh, I don't know the right words to say exactly, but uh, it has been an odd couple of weeks uh, in the life of our world and even in the life of our country. A couple of weeks ago, we saw the week start off with some controversial shootings and, and those kinds of things and we saw uh, rioting or not rioting maybe but picketing and protesting is the right word that's what I was looking for and then um, I can just remember watching TV and flipping over and seeing the shooting in Dallas last week and it really hit close to home because my niece lives in Dallas uh, hit close to home because many of you know Jordan and Lindsay Kersey who were just two days before on those very same streets um, visiting Dallas where Jordy had lived several years and um, so it was just I was enthralled by that stepped about 2 30 3 in the morning watching the newscast and then of course this week in our world has just been uh, crazy I guess it's about the only word to, to put to it um, with what happened in France just the other day and then the coup in Turkey, and the failed coup in Turkey, and then the coup in Turkey, and the failed coup in Turkey. Um, I'm not sure if they figured out yet how that has worked out, but um, it's, it's, it's sort of why we're doing this series. Because we just live in a time, I'm not going to say I'm like never before, but it has been a long time. In fact, most of us in this room are young enough that we've not experienced this level of of uprising, this level of controversy, this level of um, craziness, this level of protesting, this level of anger, this level of, I mean, some of you have, and, and I'm not calling your ages out, but some of you have, but it's been a long time, and I know in my lifetime, I was born right at the end, uh, of, towards the end of the 60s, and so there was some of that then, but I was too small to know anything about it. Um, and I and really, in my 48 years, there's not been a time like it is today, both in our country um, and in our world. And, um, and so that's why we're doing this series entitled God and Country, because uh, things are just simply going crazy. I mean, things that, that as a country we have valued, things that we have upheld, things that we have, uh, as a country, um, pushed and been behind, and to be quite honest with you, many of the rights and privileges that many of us have just taken for granted um, are now being tested and pushed, and in, in some ways, they're trying to take some of those things away, and um, I, I heard it said once before that part of the problem with those kinds of things is not the fact that the people that are pushing those agendas and the people that are doing that. It's the people who will not stand up to it or will not say no to it. And, um, and our country is just in a, word, in a weird place. These next six months uh, are going to be, uh, I can't think of a word, really turbulent would be a word, crazy would be a word um, that can really shake you up. And to be quite honest with you, it's going to be one of those times in our lives when as a believer... You're going to choose to be a believer. Um, you will choose to say, I am a follower of Christ. Or you may choose to say, I'm not. But, but it's one of those times, it's one of those things where, uh, as a country, there, there is becoming a larger and larger divide. And, and so we're going to, as believers, need to just be willing to stand up for our faith in Christ, our love for Christ, our belief in Christ, our trust in Christ. And be able to say that with boldness and with, with authority that, that I believe that. Someone posted on Facebook just the other day, a friend of mine, a long sort of statement. And I, and I love the statement, but you know, it's just them saying, look, I believe in Jesus Christ. Whether or not you do, that's up to you. But I do, and this is where I base my life on. And I believe that many of us are going to have the opportunity, if not actually be called to the carpet for the fact of our relationship with Christ uh, in the days ahead. We're in week three of this series, and let me just catch us up real quick. Week one, we talked about our moral compass, and we talked about the fact that if our morality is centered on anything other than Christ, if it's centered on a religion that God's not the center of, if it's centered on 
um, a political party or a politician, if it's centered on um, an act or if it's centered on a particular value that is not centered on Christ, then, then it's always going to be flawed. And we talked about ever since the beginning in the garden that when sin entered the world, our morality from that point has always been slipping. And sometimes it slipped real slowly and sometimes it slipped like a mudslide. And so, you know, we need to realize that our morality has to be centered on Christ. And when I say that, I'm talking about you and me. I'm not talking about the church as a whole. I'm talking about us as individuals, our individual morality needs to be centered on Christ. And last week we sort of looked at that in our Christian response. Because in my 48 years, Christians have been good at pointing the fingers at others and not pointing the fingers at themselves. They're great at calling out others and putting others on, on blast and calling them to the carpet, but they're not real good at, at pointing the finger at themselves. And so last week that's what we looked at when we said that the Bible calls us as believers to search within our hearts. To search within us and see, is there anything in us that is uh, attributing to the problem, that is helping the problem, that is accentuating the problem? Is there something in us? And then we talked about living a life that is worthy of the calling that God has given us, of living a life of righteousness and devotion to God. So that so that when others, so that when others want to falsely accuse you or when others want to slander you or others want to say something about you, then there's others that are going, that just isn't true because of their life. I can see their life and the way they live and what they do and what they say. I, I can see their lives. That just isn't right. And we're supposed to serve others. And we talked about last week that if we would just serve others, it would be so strange in this world and in this country. If we were just people of you know, to serve others. If you at your job, you were just known as somebody who always served others. It would be so strange that it would stand out. It would be so weird. Like, man, that person is just always making the coffee. That person is always, you know, I, my car wouldn't start. They, they were out there helping me jump the car off. They, I mean, if we were just serving other people, it would be so weird that others would notice. And others would ask what the difference is. Well, today we want to continue on that, and today I want to talk about, uh, the title of it is Our Faith Tested. Our Faith Tested. And, and our faith does get tested um, in this life. In fact, a lot of times when we go through difficult times, our faith gets tested. And the reality is, when we go through good times, we're not thinking about our faith at that moment. Because, hey, everything's good, everything's clicking, everything's you know, going the way it's supposed to, everything's going according to my five-year plan, everything is happening the way I want it to happen. But when bad things come, a lot of times our faith is tested. James chapter 1 says this. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. And when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So our faith is going to get tested in this world. Sometimes our faith gets tested when things don't seem fair. Right? So sometimes maybe you've said this, you know, God, you know, I love you and I, and I follow you and I'm even trying to serve you, God, but, but how come I ended up at the short end of the stick? Yes. God, you know, I, I serve you, I, read, I even read your Bible, I pray, God, how come I didn't get the promotion? You know, sometimes we look at life and we say, well, that just doesn't seem fair. And we say, well, if God's in control of everything, how come it didn't work out for me in that situation? Sometimes our faith is tested when things just don't seem right. Right? Why doesn't God just obliterate terrorists? Why doesn't God just, just thwart every terrorist attack before it happened? Why, why doesn't it mean that it's an injustice? Why doesn't God just end human slavery? Why doesn't God just, you know, end these things? And our faith gets tested because we ask those questions when we see these injustices done, when things just aren't right. We say, God, why doesn't you, why don't you just end it? Why don't you just stop it? And our faith gets tested. And sometimes our faith gets tested when things don't work for, out for us as believers. You know, sometimes we hold that as a trump card. Well, I'm a believer. Why, why didn't that work out for me? And to be quite honest with you, that's the one Satan loves to use. Because when something like that happens, it's Satan that loves to come along and whisper, says, you know what, God must love them more than you. 
Because you didn't get that promotion. They got, God must like them. He doesn't like you. And Satan likes to use that and our faith gets tested when things don't work out for us. I saw a quote back there in basketball season. Steph Curry made a, a quote, a comment about basketball. He says, you know, I doubt God's in heaven rooting for one team over the other. And yet how many of us, you know, are praying for our team to win? Or how many of us when our team loses, we're like, God, I can't believe that just happened. College football season is coming up, and you'll see a lot of people praying during college football season. On the sideline at the end of the game, the guys get ready to come out and make a kick, and you just see all these people praying. And sometimes what they're doing is saying, God, you know, I'm a Christian. I really want to win this game. So sometimes our faith gets tested when, when things don't work for, out for us as a believer. So I have a question for you today. And we're going to look at the life of someone in the Old Testament. Here's my question for you today. What would you do if you knew God was with you? What would you do if you knew God was with you? Now, I want to explain that a little bit. I'm talking about, I'm not talking about just knowing in your head that God's with you. I'm talking about if you were a hundred, a thousand percent sure that God was with you, what would you do? What could you do if you just lived with the fact and lived with the faith that God is with me. What could you do? How bold could you be at your job? How bold could you be in life if you knew God was with you? If you were a thousand percent sure that God was with you, how would it change your life? How would it change your life? You remember week one we talked about Daniel. Daniel faced a very real situation. He had to choose either I obey and follow my God that I love and that I pray to every day or I have to follow the king and his order, right? I mean, it was a very real conflict for Daniel. It was a very real life and death, actually, decision that Daniel had to make. And you know that he chose. He went home and he opened the window gates and he wasn't ashamed of it and he prayed to his God and and because of the decree that had been passed down, they took him and they threw him in a den of lions, which was literally a death sentence. You know, they weren't throwing him in there to become a lion trainer and make him jump from stump to stump. I mean, they threw him in there for dinner. He was supper for those lions. So for him, it was a life and death decision that he made to follow and obey God. He knew God was with him. And today we're going to look at the life of another man who had that similar experience. And, and, and you're going to have to hang with me today because, to be quite honest with you, his story encapsulates 12 or 13 chapters in the Old Testament. So I'm going to have to read all those 13 chapters. No, I'm just kidding. I won't let just as bad as you do. Um, but I am going to read portions of all 13 of those chapters so that we can just walk through his life. Okay, so you'll have to hang up. The reading will be sort of choppy. The scriptures will be sort of choppy, but we're literally going to cover his life. Uh, in a matter of, of, of about probably 10 or 15 minutes here. We pick up the story of this man named Joseph. Actually, when we pick up the story, he's just a kid. And, and Joseph uh, is the youngest of his brothers. He's the youngest sibling. And we pick up his story in Genesis chapter 37. So I want you, I know all the scriptures are going to be behind me. I'm sure Heather hated me this week for all the scriptures that I sent to her. Oh, and she's not. Yeah, I hated you this week. Great. <laughs> Gives me great hope and encouragement today. But just sort of hang with me. Read as they're up on the screens. If you have your Bible and want to try to keep up, great. Um, but Genesis chapter 37, we start in verse 3 and 4. And it says this, it says, Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word about him. How many of you here are the baby of the family? Yeah, nobody likes you. Um, <laughs> your, your siblings love you. They just don't like you. Because they saw you get away with everything that they didn't get away with, right? Uh, I mean, your siblings, they love you. They would... They would you know, give you a kidney if you needed it or whatever, but, but they don't like you. 
I know that Monica, she's up in the, the other building, so I probably shouldn't tell the story, but um, between Monica's the middle child, which is almost worse, but, but her sister's two years older than her, than her, but then nine years later, her mom got the flu and turned out to be a baby brother. And so Monica has a baby brother um, that is nine years younger than Monica or her sister. And Monica and her sister will get together and they'll just be like, I can't believe when, when Sandy was in high school, all the stuff he got away with, man, they would have been drilled to the wall for. I mean, late for curfew and all this kind of stuff. And, and when Monica and her sister were, were 16 and wanted a car, they had to go get a job. But when Sandy was 16, man, he just, I don't know what he did, blinked his eyes or something, but his parents went and got him a car. When Monica was in college, she worked two jobs to drive this little old it was a Geo Metro. If anybody knows what that is, you feel for her. She had this little Geo Metro and she had to work two jobs to make the payment on the Geo Metro. But when Sandy went to college, it, oh man, he's a master at this. But his parents, his parents didn't want him to go to one college, they wanted him to go to another. So to convince him to go to another college, they bought him a Nissan 300 CX. Yeah. Now you know why they hate him. <laughs> they don't hate him. They love him. But they don't like him because he got away with everything. And that's the way it was for Joseph. He was the baby of the family. J Jacob did not bring a colored robe for every guy. In fact, he didn't say he brought him a red robe. He brought this beautiful robe for just one of his children, Joseph. And that's where we pick up this life of this man named Joseph. In verse 37, verse 18. Uh, so again, we're going to skip parts of the story, but you'll be able to continue on uh, and understand where we're going. When Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they were out in the field. Uh, but there's, there's another reason why they didn't like him. He got to stay home while they were out in the field working. Okay? That's another reason. They didn't like him. And so his dad sends Joseph out to check on his brothers. And when Joseph saw his brothers coming, saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. As he approached, they made plans to kill him. Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him, and then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. But when Reuben heard of their scheme, he came to Joseph's rescue. Let's not kill him, he said. Why should we shed any blood? Let's just throw him into the empty cistern here in the wilderness. Then he'll die without our laying a hand on him. Reuben was secretly planning to rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So when Joseph arrived, his brothers ripped off that beautiful robe he was wearing, and then they grabbed him and they threw him in the cistern. Now the cistern was empty, there was no water in it. And then they were just sitting down to eat. They looked up and saw a caravan of camels in the distance coming toward them. It was a group of Ishmaelite traders, basically we would call them gypsies, uh, taking uh, a load of gum, balm, and aromatic resin from Gilead down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain by killing our brother? We, we have to cover up the crime. Instead of hurting him, let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers agreed. So when the Ishmaelites, uh, uh, who were Midianite traders, came by, Joseph's brother pulled him out of the cistern, sold him, sold him to them for twenty pieces of silver. And the traders took him to Egypt. So he goes from being the favored son, the baby of the family, the pet of the crop, to being sold into slavery. He literally goes from the top. All the way down to the bottom. And so his story continues. Chapter 39 picks up. It says, When Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, he was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of the guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Now what would you do if you knew God was with you? What would you do if you were a thousand percent sure today that God was with you? Because Joseph has just gone from the top, from being the most loved of his dad, from his dad, to being the, the most loved in the family, so to speak, of, of, his, of his dad, to being sold into slavery, to being taken to a foreign land, 
and now to be living in a place that he's not aware of and to be living as a slave. Look at verse 2. It says, The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. He's sold into slavery. He's a slave in Egypt. He's been sold to Potiphar's house, which could mean all sorts of things. I mean, who knows what his job is going to be or what he was going to be called to do. But the Lord was with him. So he succeeded in everything he did as he, as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Verse 3 continues, on. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, he, giving him success in everything that he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All of his household affairs ran smoothly. His crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, with Joseph there, he didn't have to worry about anything except of what kind of food to eat. Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. So God was with Joseph as he is a slave in a foreign land. And so because God was with him, he, played, he succeeded in everything he did. It was sort of like everything he touched turned to gold. Every plan he had flourished. Every, everything he ever saw gained and grew. And so Potiphar put him in charge of more and more and more to the point that literally he is the top dog in the house. He is over all of the other servants. He is over all of the other workers. He is over all of the administrative decisions. Where to plant the crop, when to plant the crop, when to you know, move the herd, how to move the herd. He, he's over all of the household. All Potiphar had to worry about is what I'm going to eat today. I mean, fruit loops or foster flakes. I mean, you know, that, that's all he's got to worry about. And the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 8 continues. Joseph, uh, verse 6 says he's a very handsome and well-built young man. Um, and then verse 7, this may not be up there, it says, Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come on and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my masters trust me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Joseph stood up for what was right. What would you do if you knew God was with you? What would you do if you were a thousand percent sure that God was with you? For Joseph, he said no. Potiphar's wife was pursuing him and pursuing him. He said no and no. And finally she got aggressive and said no, this is going to happen. And he said no. He said I cannot do this. It would be a great sin. And Joseph stood up for what was right. Joseph stood up in the face of when a lot of other people would have just given in. But he said no. Now look at verse, verse 16. She basically pursues him to the point of she pulls him to a room and says, sleep with me. And when he goes to run out, she grabs his, his, his cloak, is what it's called. It's more like a sheet that they would wear. And she grabs that, so he basically runs out naked, and she keeps the cloak. And verse 16 says she kept it until her husband came home. And then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave he brought into our house tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him in prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. He did what was right, did he not? He said no. And so many would have said yes. 
He said no, even when he realized that 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 saying no to her was going to put him in a very bad spot. But 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 many people would have reasoned it out in their mind in the business. Well, if I do this, then this will get me even further in in, in, in Potiphar's house. But then he ends up falsely accused and thrown in prison. See, that just doesn't seem fair to us. That just doesn't seem right to us. Look at verse 21. Here he is in prison. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. What did it say when he got sold to the slaves, what did it say? The Lord was with Joseph. What does it say when Joseph was falsely accused of standing, I mean, he stood up for what was right and then gets falsely accused of doing what was wrong and gets thrown into prison? What's the very next verse it says? The Lord was with Joseph. We're going to learn something here today, folks. I'm telling you. The Lord was with Joseph. Verse 22 and 23. But Pharaoh, oh, 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 verse 22, before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and he caused everything that he did to succeed. And so for the second time in Joseph's life, he goes from the bottom to the top. And in prison world, he ran the yard. In prison world, he, he ran the prison. He was over all of the other prisoners, over all the decisions, over all of the stuff that had to do with the prisoners. So the second time in his life, he's gone from the bottom back up to the top. <coughs> verse, chapter 41, verse 37. Joseph's suggestions were well received. So basically... He's in prison and he's risen up to risen to prominence again. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh's and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or as wise as you are. You will... Um, you will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have a rank higher than yours. Verse 41 says, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. <coughs> then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him with fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. And then he had Joseph ride in the chariot uh, reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Second time in his life he has been raised to the top. He is the second in charge behind only the king. And everyone will take their orders from him. And along comes this famine. One of the things that Joseph had done was he had told uh, Pharaoh about the dream of this famine that was coming. And he had told him that, that what's going to happen is you're going to have seven years and your crops are going to be bountiful and everything's going to prosper and everything's going to be great. But he says, but then you're going to have seven years of famine. And he said, when you have seven years of famine, he said, you need to put somebody in charge of the first seven years to make sure you're saving things up, that you're keeping things fresh, that you're going to be able to make it through the 